Hey, it's Alex. You might know me as Radio Runner on Instagram. Welcome back to my channel where I help you guys learn how to become more effective artists. Today's video is a little bit different. We're not going to be doing the same sort of lesson. A few weeks ago, I hopped on a live stream with Modern Day James, and we went over some techniques for how to paint interiors. It was a good time, had a good chat. James and I have been good buddies for a while, mostly because I paid him to give me lessons for about a year. <laughs> But if you don't take into consideration all of the monetary bribery going on, I think there's a bit of a relationship there. Anyways, I don't want to take up too much more of your time because the live stream is long enough as it is, even after I edited down the whole two hour thing down to about 50 minutes. He did say on the stream that I was allowed to use this, so we're in the clear. So that's all for me this week. I hope you guys enjoy. There he is. Hey, buddy. Hey, James. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. How you doing, man? I'm doing well. I was working on my own artwork while I'm just listening to you talk. I can't promise that I'll be super chatty either, because I, I have to finish <laughs> my brainstorm homework today before oh, class shit. tomorrow. What, uh, what's the homework? We have 30 unique paintings that we have to make and then light them three different ways. In value, in grayscale, so that's helpful. Yeah, that sounds super challenging. <laughs> if you want to look at them, I'll post what I have. Yeah, post them in, in, uh, in our Discord, Discord chat. So I've got... I've, I'm finding that I'm more comfortable with like mid scale environment scenes with a lot of like hard surface stuff because it's a lot easier to predict the lighting on that or or to instead of having to like paint lighting on mountains and stuff, which is yeah. difficult. I'm finding that painting interiors is really annoying. That's my favorite, actually. <laughs> I'm, I'm bad at it. I am not good at it. I can show you sometime how I how I like to do them. I, I picked up a lot of workflow tips from Tyler Edlin. That's a good place. Yeah. From, and he doesn't use a paintbrush. <laughs> oh, OK. Also. What? Yeah. Can you yeah. can you talk me through the workflow? Like, what does he do? Yeah, you'll make your interior and then start off with flat colors. And when you'd go through that, you do uh, a multiple pass through of lighting. So you might start off with you could lower and you could use an adjustment layer to lower down all of your local colors to a dark level, which could act as your shadows. Mm -hmm. and then go in with a lasso tool and use gradients or an airbrush to paint in light and then remove it where it wouldn't be seen. So then you have your light in your shadow and awesome. it instantly starts to read. But then you can keep going and get a lot of finesse passes with like ambient occlusion and go in there and in the shadow areas, just minor uh, variations where light wouldn't get to, um, some highlights and reflected light. And you just spend enough time on the details and it can usually end up pretty nice. Cool, yeah, I, it actually sounds kind of similar to what I was doing, but I think I was just fortunately crippled with self-doubt as I was doing it. So it, <laughs> it was not working out the way I wanted it to. I was, as I was doing that, you know, using like flat colors and lighting it, it was wor definitely working out better. Those look great, man. Mm -hmm. Here, let me show show the chat. We were in class with, uh, his name is Kenny Bell, and he is so cool. He's worked directly with James Peck. Yeah, I know. I know Kenny Bell, actually. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, he's really chill, really, really personable guy. And he was showing us some mind blowing tips for getting environments out. Cool. Yeah, that's great. See, that, that garage scene was a lot easier for me than the, the mountain site. So you had for the for the garage, you had like everything on flats and then you added all the lights in different layers. Uh huh. Yeah. Cool. Very, so very that nice. Fine painting, I've got a light still. Yeah, I probably should steal that workflow because I don't know. I was trying to make the backgrounds a little like super organic, but I'm not sure if that's uh, I'm not sure if that's the way to go. I was seeing you can not so much. I guess like you would have to draw organic shapes and because the, the layer process can make it. But like you can kind of stiffen up your painting as you yes. keep going. Yeah. And so I had found uh, Antonio and Artwad was showing his process when he paints characters. And he does that layer based method for almost all of his stuff. But he says that his key differentiator is color variation in his flats. So he doesn't go and just do blue on a shirt. He'll go and do blues and greens, a little bit of yellows and stuff like that. On skin, like the the knees might be more red because there's blood vessels or you, you see more wear and tear if you're more exposed to the sunlight. That's yeah, that's a great idea. And so as you build up and if you add variation in your layer passes too, you can you can get some of that that chaotic color to shine through still. 
That's a, yeah, that's actually a really good idea. Yeah, I'll, I'll give that a try. I'm gonna give it a go afterwards. I think what I'll do, um, because I was struggling so much, is I might do some from reference first and then hop back into it and try to design it. Yeah, that'd be good. All right, I'm gonna try your, your interior strategy. I'm just gonna do stuff from reference. I'm excited to watch. I can help you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be good. I'm just gonna pull up come on Shutterstock. I've been particularly trying to do stuff where it's like overcast or uh, not too much lighting added to it. Mm-hmm. Because it's that might be more difficult. It is way more difficult. <laughs> it's super tough. I don't know what page I'm even on. I'm just on some random. I guess I'm on John Earhart's Shutterstock. He must walk around and find abandoned, destroyed places. So that's kind of cool. Another good site is Unsplash. Oh, I've never heard of that. It's Un more like professional photographs, though. Maybe less good for reference. It might be better. I don't know what John is doing. He's just walking around taking pictures of stuff it seems what's the interior going to be is this like a, a place that they're hiding out in the yeah it's like a just it's like a destroyed building i was imagining you know like cities being stormed uh it's sort of broken down and kind of fucked up but yeah basically a, a destroyed interior there's some good destroyed interiors in here yeah all right what's my strategy here that's the easiest way too is, yeah uh, are you gonna draw straight from reference yeah i'm just gonna do one to one right i'm gonna do one to one right now just to get a sense okay. of the workflow. And so I would recreate and draw everything there and then base some flat colors off of my like estimation of the light and the dark side. Okay. Now Once you put in all of your flats, you can then like adjust it for the light or adjust it for the dark and add your the opposite with layers. Cool. I think I'm gonna try to add with the lighting as well. I'm gonna try to add a little bit more texture. So maybe I'll use like some textured brushes to get some of that goodness. Mm -hmm. Should I uh, also copy the watermark, <laughs> the Shutterstock watermark? <laughs> what do yeah, you think? That'd be fun. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. You're doing a study, right? It's yeah. All about copying. That's true. You got Yeah, you got to get exactly what's there. So yeah, Ahmed did offer to do the backgrounds, but I don't want to just harass him to do backgrounds, especially since I haven't storyboarded yet. So I don't exactly know what the backgrounds are going to look like. I um I went out yesterday and took some photos, but I actually uh. I don't have one of those ports for the SD card. It's really snowy here in New York. And so yesterday it was kind of fun just walking around, taking photos. Yeah, that's good reference. Yeah. And I was looking for overcast. overcast yep. So we had plenty of that yesterday with the snow. Yeah. See, the thing that I need to to figure out or I guess get better at here is like there's a lot of bounce lighting that goes on in interiors. And I don't know why I'm telling you this, but you know this probably better than I do. So you have that one light source, but it's kind of like bouncing all around the room and filling up mm -hmm. those gaps. And that's where yeah. my that's where yeah. my brain says, I don't want to do this. <laughs> where my brain goes, that's not what I'm into. And that's totally cool. We've all got different interests. I I like doing that. I like going through and doing the light passes. It's satisfying, kind of like how you would see something and say, oh, yeah. Yep. Well, it shows in your work. I'm pretty sure what will show in mine is that I'm not passionate about what I'm about to be doing, but <laughs> I'm going to try it anyway. Maybe eventually I'll be able to afford a desktop tablet and I can do the Macman Studio with you. Oh, yeah, man. You definitely got to get a desktop tablet. OK, am I supposed to clean up the line drawing or how I keep walking me through this process? You were my tutorial today. It's up to you. I, I mean, if we want to get to the actual learning about how to render it in a different workflow, just ignore a lot of quality. Yeah, that's kind and of what big, I was thinking. The big thing would be um, working with your lasso tool is. OK, that's what I was expecting. Mm -hmm. That's my huge workflow tip of the day. Beautiful. And Kenny in our brainstorm class was sharing that he was when he was working with James Peck at their scribble pad studios. Mm -hmm. he, he said that he and the uh, the other guy who was my instructor from last term, Case and Lamb, um, they would compete with each other for who could do more concept paintings for their clients in a day. Well, and so they'd say, I bet I could do five paintings today to get some environment concepts out. And Kenny would say, well, I bet I can do six. And Case and like, nah, man, I'll get seven in then if you're going to do that. And, and that's called James mental illness. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. And James Peck. Yeah. And James Peck, he since he's the head and he's been doing this for years and years he he just comes in whenever he feels like it so they kenny was telling us that he rolled into the studio around three o'clock 3 p.m and he comes in and says hey what are you guys working on and they say oh we're just trying to get some paintings out for this client by the end of the workday, and we're competing with each other for this many 
And James says, oh, all right, well, I'll just head upstairs and I'll knock out a couple for you, too, so you don't have to work late. So he goes upstairs to his top office and they hear him on the phone. He's chatting, laughing it up the whole time. Sounds and very like, man, he's not focusing up there. What is he really doing? And he leaves the office again at 430 and he says, OK, all my work's dropped in the Dropbox. So uh, just if you want to check it out and see if it's good for you, just let me know. And we say, OK, let's see. How many did he really get? He got seven paintings. Oh, shit. In an hour, in an hour and a half. Like nothing that's like super, super detailed, but really good, rough concepts. But and when and when you look at him from a thumbnail. Yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Totally good what that is. And then when you zoom in, it kind of falls apart a little bit. He's a but, he's a fucking master, that dude. Yeah. M- Mr. So Pack. Kenny was just you always think that you know what you're doing until you get shown up by <laughs> your, <laughs> but James Pack. real pros. Yeah. All right. I'm laying in flat colors. In this stage, I would. Yeah, give me see. give me some heads up. Actually, is it? I was doing something yesterday where I started with the lighting, and then I started with lighting and values. But maybe that's mm-hmm. a bad way to go about it. You could do that too. You don't have to apply the color to it if that would confuse you. Yeah, I think it is. Um, <laughs> Actually. Okay. Then yeah, let's go grayscale first, because then we can see exactly what the light passes are doing. You don't have to deal with color. Yeah. The, the only time that color comes into play in my thought process, though, is just when deciding the flats and deciding the color of the light source. Otherwise, I'm not thinking about, like, color harmony or how yeah. to paint. Yeah, good. I hate color harmonies. <laughs> Screw you, color harmonies. I hate when colors work well together. Do you use... Um, I, I don't want to do it, but I'm asking just out of curiosity, do you use um, like clipping masks for each of the sections? Like I'm drawing this or I'm painting this couch. Would you use a clipping mask for this individual couch and then have all the the shadows layered or attached to that? Yeah, I was going to say sometimes it depends on how I start and it can kind of change up where I will have it all condensed down to one layer. But usually it would help for you to have selections of each major object. So you could go in with like a grayscale pass. I, I would give values to every object in the room. That's so probably like that smart, couch, actually. If it was grayscale, I would make a whole selection of it and give it like a midtone. And the brick wall on the right would be like a 70% gray or something. Yeah, OK, I'll, do, I'll go about it that way. And uh, I think it's easier. It depends on how you want to approach it, but I, I like to do the light on dark process. And I think you, you had heard that Ahmed was telling you that later. As well, yep. And so I, I would darken the room or get it down to yeah. where I think yeah. the, the shadow values should be. Cool. Yeah, I'll do that. Here we'll do that. And then let's darken up the room. My first step in the process, once you get your gray values placed in for your major selections, mm-hmm. it would be the largest light source first. So I would probably, I would start from the window and use a selection with an airbrush and go through the floor up to the ceiling and just use an airbrush gradient kind of deal and light it all up and then okay. move away the shadows with like a, with a hard brush. It's a good idea to label things properly. Joby in chat is asking, hey, what do you have in mind to focus on when doing a study like this? Um, I'm really just trying to figure out how to do how to paint this way because it's not my typical way of doing things so right now i'm really just trying to get the process down if anything mm-hmm. i would try to focus on different things depending on what it is you're doing uh in this case like i said it's just am i making this work is the light reading a flow practice yeah and I, I think that's a good idea before you do any type of design work or anything make sure that the workflow actually makes sense for you and Joby's asking what the advantage to this process is. Joby, when you start working creatively, like if you start designing your own sets, it's really important to be able to manage and change what you're doing on the fly, uh, especially if you're working for a client and they say, hey, I want the color of that chair to be different. Uh, can you change that from red to blue? Well, if you painted all that in on a couple of layers or you're not working in a layer-based approach with masks, it's going to be really difficult to change that yeah. color and have it fit in the room. And so a lot of uh, environment designers use this process where they create selections of everything and then use the light on top so that they can dig all the way down their layers and change colors and change lighting on a granular level. If you wanted to go for a more painterly look, like something that Marco Bucci or Gretz would do, I don't 
I'm not confident that they use a lot of layers in their personal work. No, they don't. They don't have anybody to report to, so. That's also true. I may end up going with that in the long term. I just, for today, I wanna to try this anyway, just cause it's a good idea. Um, it seems really mm -hmm. useful for design. Not yeah. only that, not really really useful, but like, it's just a valuable thing to be able to do. And uh, yeah, I'm, I haven't decided exactly what I'm looking for in terms of the final look of things. I've always wanted to ask you, James, mm -hmm. on your lasso shapes, do you ever use just the, the free mode or is it that you always use straight lines with your lasso? Uh, I'm, I have it on free lasso and then just use the alt button to turn it into the uh, polygono. Polygonal. <laughs> not the polygono. It is not a Italian meal. Yeah, so you can switch it back and forth. That's cool. I, I just find your, your lasso shapes very distinct. Oh, your, interesting. Your shape Thanks, dude. Hopefully distinct means good. Or yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I like to just go back and forth because then, you know, I can get some of those organic shapes in there, but also, you know, get some of those harder edge shapes. Ivory in chat is saying, I must be too much of a boomer. I can't get used to the lasso tool. It's it took me a while. I was pretty anti this type of approach just because it didn't feel right for me. But I don't know. No sense in being not trying something. For myself personally, I didn't get it until I really uh, tried to buy into it when taking Tyler class. And since then, I've done nothing else. I don't paint with brushes, <laughs> basically. Honestly, it produces a completely different effect. Oh, Daniel Anderman's here. Hey, buddy. We're trying some uh, to do some studies in a style that is completely unfamiliar to me. But yeah, you definitely have a lot more control of lighting this way. Um, mm -hmm. to, to quick fill the lasso selections, I'm using control backspace. A nice little doodah. But yeah, Daniel, what, what was prompted or what prompted this was trying to do some backgrounds for these characters. I mean, I think you saw these characters when I was working on stream. Just so bad at backgrounds. <laughs> so, so I can outsource it because Ahmed said he would help me, but I, I don't want to rely on him entirely because I want to be able to, you know, I want to be able to handle myself a little bit, you know? Entirely different workflow process. It is at completely least just a mindset. different. Yeah. I was watching um, the schoolism one, the Dice Tsutumi, Tsutumi and uh, Robert Kondo. Yeah, that one's great. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So that's kind of where I was beginning with this. And they paint in a, a pretty similar manner. It's a little bit different. Like I, I see good. sometimes he, yeah, so it, it's a little bit different sometimes. Uh, at least the studies he was doing a little more in that like organic kind of way, but generally mm -hmm. it's the same idea. Yeah, I imagine good use for like the organic direct with paint style would be like color studies. Cause then you're just guessing and finding, we're looking for those harmonies. Yeah, and it could also be like, just starting off uh when like when you just start off you could start off organically and then gradually tighten it up with this kind of finish and daniel says that's a reason background painting is its own skill set <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> no i felt like i was totally starting over last year yep <laughs> i tried to pick it up okay so you're going on in with your lighting pass now you know i'm or i should be more organized and this is the problem is i'm not an organized fellow i just kind of like jump back and forth between things that was i did start my lighting pass but i will be organized i will be a good boy i can't help myself i just start doing stuff get your flats in oh yeah hold on get your flat now he's yelling at me i'm here to make sure that teach this process to you well you know what alex i'm gonna make my own process okay buddy this is my process now are you are you painting in the light or are you painting in your flat color on that chair? I was painting in shadows still. I was just softening up some of the edges. Okay. Okay. Don't get it's, mad at me. I... <laughs> Don't get mad at me. I was just painting in. I was just softening up some of the edges. I'm I'm gonna try to hold you to it and get your flats in, and then work from the biggest lights, and then work get more granular from there. So instead of focusing on just the chair. Take an airbrush or take a basic gray value, put it on like a screen layer. Yep. And wash everything in light. Oh, and then okay. You can go in. That's a good idea. So once you, so you get it all done at once, and then you go through everything, select your shadow shapes, and and clear it all out that way. Oh. Oh. So rather than using clipping masks for all these shadows, you just make a shadow layer. Uh huh. For the whole thing. Yes. So what you're telling me is I'm an idiot. <laughs> I get it. 
<laughs> I get it. I think I, un- I misunderstood. Sorry if I, if I explained it poorly. No, I probably listened poorly is really what it came down to. It's hard, actually kind of hard to tell what the, the... I think this one would be a little bit darker. Okay, let me let me go back then. Let's get let's get rid of these shadows. It's hard to tell what the value of the ground would be versus that. Okay, we'll, we'll figure that out. Mm-hmm. It's it's usually guesstimation for me. Like I would, yeah, I'd view that ground as like a maybe let's say a, a thirty or forty percent gray. The couch would be like a forty-five, or the the couch on the right would be a thirty percent, but the, the one on the left might be a thirty a forty percent gray. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna redo okay. this then. My bad. But now that you've got these selections, you can easily adjust them. Yep. That is a really good point. Okay. So if you're watching this, don't do it the way I did it. Learn from my mistakes. We are learning here. Learning on the fly. I've never learned a goddamn thing in my entire life. (laughs) You ever think the word floor should be spelt with one O? You ever think about that? It makes more sense. It does. Kind of makes a little more sense. Floor. Yeah. (laughs) It's her first, first, first time, time learning. learning. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's her first time learning here. And I want to just make a comment. Uh, Daniel Landerman says he'll embrace his artistic nerdiness. Yeah, I, I totally do. I like calling people a nerd as because it's funny, almost as if I'm not one of <laughs> not a complete nerd myself. <laughs> it's like it's hard not to be. Yeah, I, I am a I'm an obsessive nerd. The, every, everything that interests me, I go and I look up the Reddit page. I look up the the deep articles. Yeah, I think that's really the to... I think that's really the thing is like if you just get way too or not way too obsessed, but just way into things. I think that's sort of the definition of being a nerd, right? Yeah, yeah. It can be anything. You can nerd out on anything. I've been nerding out on chess too much. We need to do like a Mars weird... Mars trying to clarify on studies. Sorry to interrupt. No, interrupt me. I'm not talking about anything important. Well, he's asking, wait, so how exactly do you do a study? I analyze pictures and try to use the techniques I learned to break it down and learn how it's constructed. Yeah, so... That's, yeah. That's good. So I was going to say like, what I'm doing here, I'm trying to paint in a completely different way than I'm used to. I could then go apply this to something from imagination or I was working on that set design yesterday. So like maybe I'll paint up one of the scenes from that using this approach. So that's kind mm-hmm. of the idea is like you're one I've always story. yeah, I've always looked at it like you're trying to work out the approach so that way you can go to apply it to something else. I got my little knickknacks up here. All right, now I'll do this in the non-stupid way. Uh wait, I got one more little table to do. There's a little table back here. Hidden from view. Oh, there's actually some more stuff here. My wife came in with all of our puppies. Oh, awesome. Oh, yes. We, we are we are fostering a puppy for our shelter. And my my dog is seeing a friend across the street <laughs> and is going ballistic. <laughs> That's awesome. Dude, I love all the um all of your puppy adventures. It's great. Our newest puppy is a corgi chihuahua mix. Oh my god, precious! <laughs> All right, let's do the ceiling. Yeah, let's get that. Here, here's a hot down. tip. Yep. Uh, take a texture brush and yep. just place a stamp down, and then you can stretch it out into perspective using your transform tool. Oh, interesting. Uh, I might use the shape tool. That is a hot tip, though. Do I have any good textures, though? I deleted like, or Photoshop updated and then deleted all the brushes that I had. So I might not have a good brush for it. Yeah, it's not going to work. Don't worry. I didn't have any good texture brushes, so I'm just kind of manually doing it in here because Photoshop updated oh, and deleted all my Daniel brushes. Daniel also says that he he does planes by doing a a texture stamp and then warping it into perspective. Do you use like the, the shape tool or something or, or just a brush on full opacity? It, you can almost do it with anything. You can just make a couple brush strokes and do some yeah, splotchy yeah. stuff. And I don't, because I don't use Photoshop, but I figured it'd be the transform tool. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like whatever, whatever you could use to line up the square, but can put all of its points into perspective with the walls. Yeah, I would do it. Yeah, I would do it where um, I would definitely, Sparth has like all these cool texture shapes. So I'd probably just use that and do it. All right, now I'm going to work on my my shadow pass. All I right. get it. Okay. Now so here sense. you could put... An adjustment layer 
and like lower the exposure on all of them so that they're lower in value to match your shadow value. Oh. And then I would, you could either- Would you erase. do it that way or a multiply layer? Does it make a difference? It doesn't make a difference. It just changes which thing that you're painting for. So if you if you lower the, all the exposure, then you get to paint in the light, which I think uh, ends up with an easier mindset, better results. Okay, I, I'm gonna trust your intuition here. Okay, so I'm gonna do, rather than a multiply layer, I'm gonna do new adjustment layer. Or a, or a multiply layer and just put it all on top, that sort of deal, could do that. I'm gonna go with what you initially said. Exposure, forgot I'm painting. I keep doing this where I'm painting in, painting in darks rather than light. Either one works, so I'm not gonna tell you to, uh, that's a dogmatic rule. Um, if you are more comfortable painting in shadow. But we're trying we're that. trying new things today. We're trying okay. we're trying new things today. So I've lowered the exposure. I'm going to paint in the lights. You said screen? Yeah, you can use screen. Um, sometimes I just erase what has been in shadow. Like um, if the whole thing is is on multiply, that sort of deal, then I would just erase some of the areas. You you could mask it also. Yeah, I'll do that. Uh, and uh, I would start using selections with a large airbrush and putting in washes of light. So I wouldn't isolate just the chair. Okay. I would probably, I would start with the largest areas of light first. So I would pick the walls and the floor. Okay, let me, yeah, let me figure that out. I'm gonna start with the floor first. I feel like I just started doing art. This is how this makes me feel. <laughs> I, I'm really struggling to explain my process right now. It's, so much of it is is like just problem solving in the moment. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I guess I need to do this. There's also some stubbornness on my part of what I'm just used to doing. Yeah, I'll, I'll blame it on you. Sure, that's a good way to go. Just blame it on somebody else. <laughs> okay, now I can soften up these edges too, I can call it. And Tyler Edlin does a thing where he saves all of his original selections into a folder so that he can then reference them for quick selections. Oh, OK. And as he as he works through his paintings. Idea. So if you get tired of re in your space and stuff. I like the painting light on approach because it's very deliberate. Yeah. And that way, what you put in light is exactly what you want to be there, rather than having the light be all kind of uniform and the variation being in the shadows, which it usually isn't as important. I, know you I keep... like to go ahead. No, I was going to say, I know you keep saying not to go to small surfaces and then I'm just doing exactly that. I won't do that. I'll go. I'll do the, the ceiling one moment. I just get my brain just wants to do what it wants. It does just does what it does. Oh, here's a weird situation, which is couch two. No, did I not label this properly? This is why you got a table or label stuff. Mm. Oh, I did label it it's just hidden from view. Yeah, I see how useful this is, though, in terms of, oh, I want to go back and tweak uh, tweak the lighting. You can just make a bunch of these adjustment layers with different settings. Yep. Yeah, it's really cool. And then as you get comfortable to the, with the layer process, you can start to try and purposefully throw in imperfection. So yeah. You would add grunge and texture on the flat layers, also add it in your lights and your shadows and stuff like that. That makes sense. All right, I'm going to paint in some more light. There's quite a gradient over here, so let's... Yep, so you'd ever want to use your gradient tool or just an airbrush with yeah. low opacity and gently build it up. Cool. Or I guess in this case, you'd, you'd eat away at your mask. So interesting. I feel like I'm <laughs> now in the 21st century of digital art. As you can see the gif of math equations flying across Jamie's face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait, who said that? Oh, <laughs> Will did. Of course. Yes. Check it out. Yeah, now it works. Oh, I get and it the now. The beauty of this too is you can colorize all this pretty easily. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna sound really ungrateful, but I don't think I like working this way. <laughs> no, it's fine. I get it. <laughs> um, but this is so, it's amazing how useful it is. It's really sad that my brain is annoying like that where it's like, no, nah, I don't wanna do this. But it's it's so useful. It's ridiculous. Yeah, you really can like, oh, I got to fix that on the back there. I do like it, though. It's not that I don't like it. It's just it feels unintuitive to me, I guess. Mm -hmm. If working with shadows is easier, you can try that again in the future and maybe it would click better. 
Yeah, it's possible. It's possible. A med suggested against it as well. So I'm wondering, you know, I don't want to just be stubborn for the sake of being stubborn. Will feels like he's taking differential equations. <laughs> the Stardust Observer says that he thinks this process looks fun. I agree with you. No, I yeah, really the, like it is. I, I, I'm not trying to insult the process at all. It's more of just not my mm -hmm. cup of tea. I think it's amazing uh, in terms of it's like a really smart workflow, and especially if you're doing things like, um, you know, if you were doing set design, it's probably in, it's incredibly important to to do this sort of thing because you can really mess around with so many different lighting scenarios. But I'm yeah, I'm glad. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad he's watching because then this might be something he wants to apply. Mm -hmm. And this might be something you could talk about on your YouTube channel. I plan to. It's like, I do like to show this stuff. Why don't I'm you just take this stuff. clip of this live stream and just put it on there? I'm, not, I'm actually not kidding. I think that's not a bad idea. I, I mean, oh, really? yeah, I mean, if you want, it's up to you because uh, I don't want to tell you how to run your channel, but I'm finding this really informative. Well, okay. I'm I'm just letting sure. know that you are welcome to do that if you'd like, but I have to figure out how to rip your YouTube stream. Oh, I'll just send it to you. Oh, OK. Well, yeah, that'd be nice. And then I'll superimpose my face next to you. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It would have been a smart move. Just, for... a, just a picture of me. Yeah, because <laughs> I don't have video right now. Yeah, I could have. Um, I could have actually done it where I had your face in there. So I messed oh, I up. Don't, I don't have a webcam yet. Oh, OK. Well, then there's no way I could have done that then. That is uh, why I'm excited about getting a, a real camera. You know what's great about this process, I will say? Um, <laughs> doing these gradients in terms of like gradients that you would get on walls and stuff. Yes. is really, really good. It's really good to uh, get those. Yeah. And you, you can take that into your normal painting process, too. Like, you don't have to do all of this dogmatically. Like, yeah. you, you have to start out with all the flats. If you want to do your typical, um, your Zorn palette or your direct painting style, then you can say, OK, well, on this wall, I want a gradient. So I'll just <laughs> flat it first and yep. then wash in my light. And it's very smart, very wise and indeed. The next couple of steps that you would get in after this would be to do an ambient occlusion pass, pass and a reflected light pass. OK, the, the question is, is <laughs> when is ambient occlusion? Is that when uh, it just like gets completely dark in a particular area? Yeah, so ambient occlusion would be where it's not just shadow. It's it's areas of shadow where <clears throat> light isn't touching anything at all. OK, and um, if you want to look up references you can look up like um gray box renders in in blender and stuff so like just just a 3d model with all of the color removed yeah and you can look at and so marco bucci for anyone who's listening and doesn't know about ambient occlusion as well he has two videos on the topic that are excellent. yes i i saw it and completely i always forget what ambient occlusion is even after watching that video <laughs> <laughs> it is it's the like the number one thing that adds to I, I post my studies on Discord and stuff and people are like, did you use 3D for this? Is it no? No. I, I didn't I didn't start to get those questions until I started using ambient occlusion. Okay. Renzo in chat is asking if this style was used in Spider-Verse. Um, basically, yes. It's it looks that way because of the opaque shapes. Like instead of using paint brushes with opacity. You you use a lasso method and very distinct graphical shapes. You should watch um, Zach Retz. He was one of the, the designers for that. Um, I love Zach Retz. Yeah, he actually his approach starts organic and then kind of gets into, you know, uh, more solidified shapes. Mm -hmm. um, so he's kind of a good middle ground, I think. And Patrick O'Keefe also has a Learn Squared course showing you how he illustrated in the for Spider-Verse concepts when he was art director. Oh, cool. And Surya is asking, what is a pass? A pass just means to pass over with a with a new wash of lighting effects. So you would have multiple different things. You would start off with a main light pass. So where the window is hitting light, then you would do an ambient occlusion pass. And so 
you would go through every object in the scene and add in your deep, deep shadows. Then you might do a reflected light pass where you go in and add all of your weak light. And over time it builds up. And so you can do it in a more methodical way. I'll have to send you a brush, James, or you can download it. It's a Jing, Jing sketch on Gumroad. He's got a brush pack and there it's free. There's one brush in there that he specifically calls what is I'll look it up real quick. He uses it for ambient occlusion. It's okay. designed for it. and uh, he calls it edge control. And one side of the brush is totally hard edged and the other side of the brush is a gradient. Cool. So you you can go in with a on a multiply layer and uh, you can add in your ambient occlusion just by drawing. So it makes it really quick. It's looking like a room. Yes, it is. And that's why you you fools have to subscribe to Alex's channel. Also, I'm pretty sure I selected this top of the chair and I turned it off. Nicole's in here and Brian. I've got friends. Hey, guys. Got friends in the chat. Right, let's figure out this dusty stuff. I'll do that with some texture. Brian's asking how we're coping with the whole COVID situation. Um, doing a lot of work. <laughs> Um, yeah, I've been keeping my head down. Yeah, that's about it, really. There's not much else you can do. It's, it has been tough, especially like I feel like I'm here in you know New York, paying New York prices, uh, and then not really getting anything out of it. So it's kind of upsetting, mm -hmm. and that's why I'm moving. Don't know where to. We're out of state? Maybe. Ooh. Think thinking about it. Come to Kansas City, where the houses are 100k. That sound. I'm not gonna lie. That sounds awesome. And it's crazy coming from New York. They, you know, I've just, you know, I was born here and just used to prices of things being way too overpriced for no reason. Oh, I forgot to put the yeah, giant watermark. That's how watermark. we were able to afford our house. No, <laughs> no, you can do that last. <laughs> okay. Put that on a separate layer. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's so awesome that you guys can, you know, the concept of somebody being able to afford a house here in New York is pretty much unfathomable. Yeah, it's laughable. Laughable. Oh, no. Oh, oh no. Oh, no. Hey. Mm -hmm. What did I Meek do moved in Kansas City? What happened? I don't know. What's wrong? I don't know what I did. I think I fixed it though. We're good. I got stressed out. <laughs> this is stressful for me. What are you saying about Kansas City? I cut you off because I was I was thinking I was ruining everything. Just that Meep in the chat lives here. Oh, cool. Well, I'm glad you're there, Meep. Meep Meep. <laughs> he says it's it's a great city, but not a lot of game studios or concept art. I don't care about that. Yeah, not a problem for James. Yeah, they do have a uh, 3D asset studio. That's that, cool. That makes very professional work here. John Park was telling me, though, that he thinks a lot of studios are going remote. Yeah, so don't matter. If I'm ready in two or three years, I shouldn't move if I want to stay. Yeah, I mean, it seems like uh, everything's going to be remote, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, why leave? Who would have ever thought that you could say thank you, COVID? For yeah, <laughs> it's one of the few things that you can thank it for moving our dinosaur of an industry forward. All right, where's when, when do I start adding all the demons and monsters? You could probably fit in a cool pair of glowing eyes in that door frame. There we go. Yeah, I think for me, what, be, what would be a good approach here is start it maybe kind of loose just to get the values in, because I don't know though, maybe maybe I should just suck it up and not be not complain, but I'm, I'm not certain yet. I want to find a good oh, middle ground. Workflow. Yeah, I want to find a good middle ground for this, but. It definitely works a lot better for making adjustments, changing lighting scenes or lighting scenarios. I am not offended. You can trash it as much as you want. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm I know. I, I'm just trying to figure it out for myself. Is <laughs> no, this Surya is mentioning that the, the ambient occlusion brush that I mentioned to you doesn't work on Photoshop Oh, because it's made for iPad. So an alternative would be to use a soft airbrush and make selections and then feather in against edges. So we can go over that soon. Yeah, we'll do that in just a bit. I'm going to do a few more things. Oh, yeah, I got to add light to that TV. And COVID has been difficult for me going off of Brian's question and that it's hard for me to keep track of the schedule. I, I do miss that from having my day job. Because I, I had to be really diligent about staying on task. Yeah. It kept me very productive. So I would, I'd wake up at six in the morning and I would make breakfast and get two and a half hours of art practice in before I went to work. Yeah, I find that um, just doing art in general, it's kind of difficult to like have an actual schedule. The live streaming helps because then it, it's like, okay, each day you have such and such a thing to do. 
but that certainly is a challenge staying like mentally healthy with uh yeah with the schedule yeah Ava's asking where to get the ambient inclusion brush. Um, the Jing sketch one apparently does not work on Photoshop, but I'll type his name in the chat. Jing sketch on Gumroad has a free brush pack, and the edge control brush works on iPad. Uh, Sam Sam Nielsen of Schoolism, he has a free brush pack on his personal website, and he works in Photoshop and Clip Studio, and I know that he has an ambient occlusion brush too. All right, so I need, I, I'm sorry. I'm going to sound like the most difficult person to teach ever. Explain <laughs> ambient occlusion to me one more time. Yeah, I, I only, I, I didn't really explain it. I only said okay. that Marco Bucci taught, teaches it. Okay. So ambient occlusion is caused when two objects come in contact, get closer in contact with each other, so they start to obfuscate light. Okay. Or they get more and more for, to blocking direct light or reflected light. So if light can't hit directly, and you would also guesstimate that reflected light can't reach there either, you're going to get a gradation to near black because there's no oh, light. Oh, okay. I see. Okay. I know what that is actually then. That's something that I just... So do you think I should do that on a new layer? Yes, okay. absolutely. Okay. Okay. I Okay. Now I know what you're talking about. I don't know why I didn't know that was called ambient occlusion. Um, you see it a lot... Um, when it's overcast actually because yes uh, exactly yeah, 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 yeah that's probably like the primary way to paint an overcast scene because it's literally just flats with ao so are you working on that pass now are you doing are you on a separate layer yeah i'm on a separate layer i just need the layer to not be at 10 percent, and then we can actually see it <laughs> so like if if for how i would try the ambient occlusion under that chair is i would use an airbrush and i'd use a pretty broad like a large brush okay. overall. And I would open up your selection a little more, basically towards the edge of the shadow. Oh, okay. And then I would use a broader soft brush so that you have a larger gradation. But what you have there looks good too, and I don't want to mess that up. I think it's, you mess it up. Thing. You can mess it up. It is totally fine. It's it's something that I mostly eyeball. It's like, is that too much? Is that too yeah. little? And just inch away at it. Something that people should keep in mind, and I had problems with starting out, is the whole separation of lights and darks. Yeah. And um, it's easy to think, well, hey, there's all these different dark values in this study that I'm working on. But if, if you can condense it down to, no, there is a shadow value, and then the only variation is where light is just straight up not touching. Yeah. So then you get your shadows and you get your amb ambient occlusion and your dark values will get so much cleaner. Cool. Actually, I do need to do a couple of things before I jump to that, but that is all very helpful. See, this should have been Workout Wednesday in, term of, in terms of my naming, <laughs> YouTube naming conventions. E. Ranto, I think is how you pronounce it. He's asking, how do you add ambient occlusion onto glass? So for example, a glass with water. Oh, so maybe like a cup filled with water lit by a lamp at a 45 degree angle. I think you would just be best off to look at a reference for that. I agree. Like I, I wouldn't know the process. The That's question would be really random. The question didn't even register in my brain, so I can't answer it. <laughs> Sometimes that happens where I hear words and then I'm like, I don't even know what was just said. How do you add ambient occlusion to a glass glass of water? Oh, um, I don't know. Probably the same way you do it to other stuff, I would imagine. Yeah, you definitely just got to use reference and just look at what the material is doing. I hate when the brushes don't predict exactly what I want them to do with my my mind. If anyone wants um, to find a tutorial series on rendering and light physics that isn't Scott Robertson's book, uh, Sam Nielsen on Schoolism has two very good courses on it. He has Lighting Fundamentals and Lighting for Storytelling, which is the advanced version. We didn't light the ceiling yet, but let's do it. I got some weird uh, edges going around at the junctions mm. between something, so I got to clean that up at some point. But well, Ryan Pallet's giving you a compliment, saying your study looks mighty fine. Oh, thanks, Ryan Pallet. Um, it's I never worked this way. It's very weird. It's weird for me. My brain is like not happy about it, but I'm I'm happy that I'm learning something different. So that's always cool. I have a video out that I was, or a video that I finished that was going to be on painting. And as I'm doing this, I'm like, well, this is very different from what I was going to put out. Cool. Different mindsets, different approaches. 
more like incorrect mindsets. Doubtful. <laughs> yeah. No, I think it'll be all right. If Connor says everything I do is perfect. Well, that's very wishful thinking. Thank you. Sketch Matters is asking, how do you normally draw stuff like this? Are you asking, like, <laughs> how do you do this again? Or how would James? If do you're asking this? how I normally do it, the answer is I don't. So that's <laughs> that's really it's generally the way I was trying. Let's see. Uh, I mean, I guess when I'm painting something, I, I generally will start with like a looser brush. Um, yeah, I start with like a really loose brush and then try to get a variation in color and stuff. Um, and then try to find shadow shapes in that. Kind of like I'm finding shadow shapes here. So it's it's similar in that regard. Yeah, some fundamentals don't change. It's just how you approach getting to them. Yeah, the real question is, what am I going to do for these backgrounds in the animation? Because, you know, am I going to do it line art style? I still don't know what I want to do with it. I'm being, I think part of me is just doesn't want to do this for the backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure. I just need to nag Ahmed <laughs> to do the environments. I was reading through the art book for The Legend of Korra. Mm -hmm. And because the, the background work in that show is the single most impressive I've seen in any animated TV show ever. It's so detailed and so painterly at the same time, like almost no, it's, what's what Monet? What was that whole movement? The type uh, of painting impressionist, you mean? Yeah, it's it's loosely impressionist in its brushwork. But they start off with these insanely detailed line drawings. Oh, OK, and maybe maybe that's need to do something like that. And so they, they have a background drawer that will draw these obscenely detailed. They'll they'll go in and they'll texture out all of the wood and everything, which seems unnecessary because then the painter goes in and kind of covers it up. But they try to maintain a lot of that detail. And it's, it's just so impressive. That's awesome. Um, Ryan, I I'm thinking of doing interior paintings for the yeah, for the uh, these these dudes. But I don't know what sort of style background I want to go for. I'm not sure if I want it to be painted. Um, what you're describing now, Alex, sounds kind of like what I'm thinking. Um, yeah, I looked at some Ghibli stuff. I looked at, obviously, I looked at Avatar. I have the Avatar book to my right. That's something. All those are things that I've considered. I'll link some of those photos. Yeah. I, it's also just because I'm one person, I have to, you know, be somewhat economical about it as well. Like, I was, I was looking at... Uh, Tanico Panto's animated shorts that he did. And usually the backgrounds are pretty like impressionist. They're not incredibly detailed. And I think, you know, I might need to go that route because it is a lot. Just imply the perspective and then fill in the blanks. Yeah. Kind of deal. And somebody said the the Ghibli background seems simple. I, I have to disagree. The Ghibli backgrounds are pretty intense. Yeah, those are very complex. Those are, yeah. Their beauty is in how they, they appear simple. Yeah, they're they're really, I have to argue that they're very complicated. You're just getting pings from me, uh, screen sending some of the screenshots oh, from cool, the Legend cool. of Korra book. Luckily, I muted my pings, <laughs> so I don't hear it. Yeah, that's smart. Yep. Here it is asking if the darkness between the keys of a keyboard is ambient occlusion. I think that's probably more mainly shadow, because keys are so small. That you're like you're whatever the light isn't touching, you're just seeing where it's not. But you can look at your room, look in the corners of the upper corners of your room. Notice how the light doesn't really touch in some areas, and the corners, especially where every wall meets at the three points, is the darkest area. Yeah, those wall gradients are definitely. I feel like this is the only way to go for some of that, those interior gradients. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think I might be overthinking the backgrounds. I, I've been talking about this a, a little bit, um, but I was looking at a lot of different animations, like even big ones like Mulan and stuff. Their backgrounds are really subtle and it's it's mostly just like gradated values and stuff. Yeah, yeah that is simple. Super duper simple. One of the tastiest things in renders for me is where you you have soft shadows where the form changes, but it's also got a hard cast shadow on top so you get that contrast right next to each other mm -hmm. it's like man that's juicy looks good yeah are these for cora the what you what you sent yeah they're just amazing yeah it's epic definitely not in scope <laughs> no <laughs> they're really really good <laughs> no it was, it was just thinking that i was thinking like man how does this make sense for their production pipeline to have these 
crazy detailed backgrounds and then go over all of it in paint. I don't know. They must have a lot of people painting them up. It's epic. Um, Klaus is just awesome. Yeah, I agree. And and by awesome, you mean stars and stars. Yeah, Klaus is really Klaus amazing. has a couple of videos on YouTube going over their process. Yeah, I was watching them. It was so cool. So epic. They like they do a traditional animation style and then they they basically invented a, um, a, a software or they had somebody invent the software and it uses machine learning to figure out where the silhouette is going to be. It's super crazy. That's also not in scope. <laughs> no. <laughs> but yeah, I think I'll probably end the stream now because I'm going to take a break. Anyway, I'm going to go and uh, yeah, I'll catch all of you guys later. Thank you so much for tuning in.